Good evening, everyone. I'm Louise Mirror, New York Historical Society's President and CEO, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual program, How I Led the Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. This special program is presented exclusively for New York Historical and offered by invitation only. We are so very grateful to each and every one of you for your generous support especially at this challenging time. Just before I introduce our speakers, I want to recognize and thank New York Historical Trustees who are joining us this evening. First and foremost, our outstanding board chair, Pam Schaffler, the chair of our executive committee, Richard Reese, the chair of our chairman's council, Susan Danilo, and trustees, Buzzy Gadould, Ed Hintz, Ryan Kane, Patricia Klingenstein, Sid Lapidus, Suzanne Peck, Russell Penoyer, Jean Reed, Ellen Shook, Jillian Steele, Cy Sternberg, Susan Waterfall, Michael Weisberg, Jane Weitzman, and David Zelaznik. I'd also like to thank members of our Chairman's Council for their unwavering support and acknowledge our Palm Beach supporters who are in attendance this evening. We are so very sorry, especially on a freezing cold day in New York like this one, that we had to cancel our Palm Beach weekend this year. Rest assured, we will be back in town in 2022. I'm particularly grateful tonight for the partnership and support of First Republic, the sponsor of this evening's program. And I am delighted to welcome those of you from the company who have joined us this evening. Now then, we are very pleased indeed to welcome Susan Eisenhower, one of President Dwight D. Eisenhower's grandchildren who's a consultant, author, and Washington DC-based policy strategist with many decades of work on national security issues. She's currently president and chairman of the Eisenhower Group, Inc., and chairman emeritus at the Eisenhower Institute of Gettysburg College. She's also been a fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics and a distinguished fellow at the Nixon Center, now called the Center for National Interest. Her newest book is How I Led the Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. Joining us as moderator this evening is David Rubenstein. Mr. Rubenstein is the co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest private investment firms. His patriotic philanthropy is legendary with life-altering gifts to renowned American institutions such as Monticello, Montpelier, the Library of Congress, and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Mr. Rubenstein is the author of the 2019 book, The American Story, Conversations with Master Historians, and the recently published How to Lead, Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs, Founders, and Game Changers. He is as well the host of New York Historical's History with David Rubenstein, a nationally televised PBS series uh, that you can watch in Washington, D.C. over WETA and in New York on WNET Channel 13. Tonight's program will last about an hour and it will include some time for questions and answers. Your questions can be submitted via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. In the interest of simplicity, we have disabled the chat function tonight, so please do remember to use the Q&A. Our speakers will get to as many questions as time allows. And now it is my great pleasure to yield our virtual stage to tonight's speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Susan, for joining us tonight. So Susan, um, I really enjoyed your book, How I Gled. Um, came out last year, um, but it's 50 years after your grandfather died in roughly 1969, I believe he died. Uh, why mm -hmm. did you wait roughly 50 years to write a book about your grandfather? Well, I'm not sure that I was uh, planning on writing this book. It just sort of uh, tapped me on the shoulder. And I felt the time was right now because uh, several things happened. First of all, we were celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of the end of World War II. Then in September, the Eisenhower Memorial was dedicated. Um, and I thought even during um, a tumultuous political time that we're currently living through that um, Dwight Eisenhower still had something to say to us. 
So those three factors um, uh, inspired me to, you know, sit down behind my desk and get started. So I guess if your last name is Eisenhower, you can probably get access to the Eisenhower family uh, uh, documents and so forth. Or was there any problem in getting any documents that you wanted to get? And did you discover things that other people hadn't discovered before in doing research? Well, I wrote a, a book 25 years ago. I don't know how a national security person ends up writing two books on the Eisenhowers, but it was a book that was uh, about my grandmother largely, but it was really about their emotional life and their marriage and their time together. And it was there that I was able to use so many family letters that had never been seen before. This particular book is really a leadership book. And, you know, I've used scholarship. Uh, I've used uh, the perspective of many of the people who served with them. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to actually uh, use some of what uh, I knew of him and my family knew of him to uh, explain some of the reasons why he made the decisions he did and why. So before we get into it, I just wanted to make sure for people who are watching, they would know the, the lineage. Um, Dwight Eisenhower and Mamie Eisenhower had one adult child, one who mm -hmm. lived to adulthood, that is your father, is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, also in the military and also a, uh, an ambassador at one point. Yes, to Belgium. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you have three siblings, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and all of them are somehow involved in, in you know, things with relating to the Eisenhower Institute or Eisenhower related family matters. Well, there are a lot of uh, Eisenhower legacy organizations and we all uh, help them. I, when I say there are a lot, they're, they're four very distinguished institutions and, and uh, we uh, certainly uh, add our uh, support and help to them. Um, but all, everybody's doing something uh, different. I'm a consultant and I uh, do some teaching. My brother's a professor, my sister's an interior designer. My younger sister has been involved in international exchange organizations uh, all of her career. So it's, we have a very varied uh, um, set of activities. So when you meet somebody you don't know and you have the last name Eisenhower, how long does it take before somebody says, are you related to Dwight Eisenhower? Is that a minute or a second or how long? Well, it depends on where you are. Um, <clears throat> but I will tell you something very interesting, invariably, it takes only 30 seconds to a minute for that to happen uh, at Union Station, Washington, DC. Uh, the African-American uh, clerks uh, who um, sit there, uh, you know, and uh, at the ticket counter, uh, many of them remember the moment when Dwight Eisenhower uh, in his first term desegregated Washington, DC. I see. Well, let's talk about that in a moment, but let's talk about something you did recently in DC. Uh, the Eisenhower Memorial you uh, referred to earlier uh, was designed by a very famous architect, Frank Gehry. But I think you led an effort among others to say it really wasn't well designed. Um, what was the problem with the original design and are you happy with it now? Well, I don't think it was the design as much as it, it was uh, how it, it, it came together. And this certainly was not uh, Frank Gehry's fault. This was uh, the way I think the memorial was conceived. The, the uh, whole uh, emphasis and focus of the memorial was on Ike as a young boy looking at his future. And I, I dare say that uh, everybody who was memorialized on the mall was a young boy and had a future. I, I think um, what we ended up with was, was really terrific, which was uh, to focus on Eisenhower's wartime and presidential leadership. Uh, and the backdrop now is the uh, beaches of Normandy in peacetime. And then when you walk into the memorial, there is a, a bust of a young boy looking off into the distance. And it, so it really has uh, some of that element, but it's not the key focus. And, and yes, we're absolutely delighted with it. So when I was a young boy and I, President Eisenhower was president, I remember in those days people were saying it was a dull administration, it wasn't exciting. But now everybody is saying, please give us that again. We didn't have inflation very high. We had high economic growth. We didn't have any wars. I mean, do people tell you that all the time that they wish that Eisenhower was in president again? Uh, well, they do. And um, often it's the same people who uh, recognize my name. And I, I should say, of course, uh, um, a lot of people do in, in Europe, especially when I travel there, they assume I'm a member of the family. Um, and so, uh, they were. Um, uh, Ike's objective was to bring about unity of purpose in this country and 
uh, he set as a real goal, uh, you know, economic prosperity and felt that uh, with the advent of nuclear weapons, uh, there would be uh, no way to um, avoid the potential for cataclysm without avoiding war altogether. So uh, he managed to have no combat casualties uh, after he ended the Korean War. Now, your grandfather was president until you were about, I guess, nine years old or so. So did you, do you have memories of going to the White House or, or Camp David or, or other things relating to being, uh, his being president? Well, I, I do. I have many memories of the White House, and including the three, um, the three parakeets uh, up on the third floor, the area called the solarium. And uh, as kids, we used to like to play um, in the uh, up and down the back staircases. And there are all kinds of tunnels, actually, that connect certain rooms. So it's always fun to know that. I will say, though, David, what's really interesting about it is that um, if I go into the White House today, I can st tell you they're still using the same floor polish because, you know, the immediate sensation of that smell takes me right back. So uh, it was said that uh, that Shangri-La was a place that was built by, uh, uh, I guess, FDR. They took a military place called Shangri-La, I think it was called, and President Eisenhower renamed it Camp David, uh, supposedly <laughs> after um, uh, your brother. But did you ever ask him why he didn't name it Camp Susan or something like that? <laughs> well, actually, there's a, a funny little story that goes with that. Yes, um, uh, Camp David was named for my brother, but there were three presidential yachts at the time. And one of them was named the Barbara Ann, the other was named the Susie E. And then when my younger sister came along, um, actually, I should have said there were two yachts. Uh, there weren't any more yachts, so the outboard motorboat was called the Mary Jean. Uh, in any case, uh, after uh, his presidency, um, the uh, two yachts were decommissioned, uh, but I think because of Khrushchev's visit to Camp David, uh, that name had now entered the history books, and so there we are. Um, but it's um, it's a it's a wonderful place, and we have many memories of sledding in the winter time and uh, really enjoying what is a remarkable um, spot of rest and retreat for any president. So, if you've been the Supreme Allied Commander on D-Day and you're president of the United States, among other positions he held, uh, is it very difficult to have a, a granddaughter, grandfather relationship? Because he's saying, look, don't you know I'm Supreme Allied Commander, I'm president <laughs> of the United States, you just can't call me grandpa. What did you have to, what did you call him? And was he really nice to deal with or was he not that easy to deal with because he was so busy? I, I just can't even begin to tell you what a, what a wonderful engaged grandfather he was. I don't know how he did it. Uh, one of the things I discovered as I was writing this book, um, was that certain things were going on at exactly the same time we were having um, other family uh, uh, gatherings of uh, one sort and another. He really was remarkable at the way he could manage his responsibilities in the context of uh, being a balanced person. And I, I really admire that. I, I can tell you that he came to, I, used, I rode his horses. He came to my horse shows and um, sometimes he came to my uh, sister's ballet recitals and my uh, brothers uh, swimming meets and uh, was very engaged and had, um, you know, lots of things to offer us. Um, and anyway, he loved kids. He really did. So what did you call him and what did you call your grandmother? Well, it's funny. In the beginning, we used to call him Ike. And then apparently one of us at a press conference retorted when a, a, uh, when a reporter said, Mr. President, um, I think it was my brother who piped up and said, he's not Mr. President, he's Ike. And I never forgot the moment when uh, we got pulled back uh, into the family circle and told in a very stern way, uh, he is going to be called granddad from now on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And what did you call your grandmother? Uh, we called her Mimi. She did not want to be uh, called any grandmother related name because she was uh, very modern and she was hugely fun. Uh, she's a real character. And so we called her uh, Mimi and uh, it confuses people because they know her as Mamie. So, but she was Mamie to us. Okay, so let's go back to Abilene, Kansas. Your grandfather is one of seven brothers. Seven, seven boys altogether. Yes. Right. And where Six did his five. father, his parents came from? Were they immigrants, or did their family had previously come from Germany, or was his father born in the United States? Uh, his father was born in the United States, outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. 
Uh, but the Eisenhower family did come from uh, uh, the Odenwald uh, in, in Germany and left from Saarland uh, to come to the United States in 1741. Ironically, during World War II, Ike was commanding troops not far from his uh, ancestor's homeland, which can still be seen. Was it a wealthy family or what did uh, his father do, Eisen, President Eisenhower's father? Was he a farmer or what did he do? Well, I would say that the, this was um, a river brethren community. They were a subset of the Mennonites and actually as um, a productive farmers went, they were pretty uh, well off. But my uh, great grandfather did not want to be a farmer and uh, went into business for a time before he suffered at the hands of one of the farming depressions. Uh, so I would say that they came from very modest, very modest financial circumstances. So did uh, your grandfather say, I want to be the, uh, a five-star general someday, and therefore I'm going to go to West Point? And why did he go to West Point? Did he really want to be a soldier? Well, I can tell you this. He wasn't saying he wanted to be a soldier around that household because um, my great-grandparents uh, were uh, ardent pacifists, uh, and Ike was raised as a pacifist in a pacifist community. Uh, but he loved history, and uh, he also worked after graduating from high school to put his older brother through college. Uh, so he went to West Point for the free education, and it, it um, you know, offered a lot of um, uh, historic background, and, and he loved that. And, of course, everything changed when he got to West Point. So in today's atmosphere, um, if he had been given this position, people would say, well, don't you know his father was a pacifist? In, in, in today's environment, you know, you you kind of find bad things to say about people, but that didn't turn out to be his problem. He was not a pacifist, right? No, he wasn't. And uh, he commanded, uh, you know, the, the largest um, unified military operation in history. And uh, he, he turned out to be um, a real soldier, uh, which I think informed everything, including uh, his presidential years. So was he a leader at West Point? Was he near the top of his class like Douglas MacArthur had been, or was he, <laughs> Um, we're in the middle and what, what were his activities at West Point that were distinguishing? I think it took uh, Ike a while to get uh, used to West Point and he was very well disciplined at home, uh, but there are a lot of um, what seems like silly rules when you first get there in your plea beer. So he was a little bit of a, he was slightly rebellious. He was always questioning the rules. I wouldn't say he had the best uh, by any means uh, disciplinary record, uh, graduated, um, uh, you know, around the 70 percentile in, in the class. So nothing very distinguished. Uh, but for some reason, uh, oh, and then he had a um, serious football injury. Um, he broke his uh, knee and uh, West Point wasn't quite sure whether they were going to graduate him because of that physical disability. But uh, somebody on the staff uh, wrote in one of his efficiency reports that uh, he was born to command. Well, he played football, and there's a story about how he tackled Jim Thorpe, the uh, great uh, Carlisle running back, one of the greatest athletes in American uh, history. I guess he was uh, determined to show that uh, he was a pretty good tackler. Is that right? Uh, sh he sure was. I don't think that's the game where he suffered this knee injury. And by the way, that knee injury bothered him all of his life. Uh, he was very interested in my horseback riding career, uh, but he couldn't ride anymore because of this knee injury. Uh, nevertheless, he was a strategic leader and uh, did not have to be engaged in the same kind of physical activity that other soldiers did. Now, when he graduated, uh, it was a little bit too late to go into World War I in combat, but eventually he did work for Jack, uh, General, General John Pershing. What did he do for General Pershing? Well, he, uh, uh, for General Pershing, he wrote the uh, uh, guidebook uh, to the American battlefields of France. Uh, these were the battles that occurred after the America's entry into World War I. But let me say, David, one thing that's really interesting about uh, how he did spend World War I, he was commanding a tank, uh, a tank corps in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and was responsible actually for not only training the troops that were about to go to the front and he was going to join them, uh, but also managing the Spanish flu influenza. Um, and for his management of that uh, pandemic at Camp Colt, he received a Distinguished Service Medal at the age of 28. So is that how he fell in love with Gettysburg and later retired there? Is that when he uh, made the first contact with Gettysburg? I think, I think that probably had a lot to do with it. Okay, so later on his military career, after World War I, uh, he has a number of assignments, but ultimately he winds up working for 
uh, Douglas MacArthur as kind of his chief of staff or something like that. Was that a pleasurable experience uh, based on anything you've heard or you read? Well, I, I, I love the idea of a pleasurable experience. I would say um, a highly mixed. Uh, at one point, and Ike was a great diarist, uh, he said that um, Douglas MacArthur was a genius at giving clear instructions, dot, dot, dot. And then it goes on from there. I think uh, Mac uh, MacArthur was way too flamboyant, too um, uh, focused on his own fortunes, um, a little bit uh, too hard on the staff. And I think I looked at this and thought, now, this is not the kind of leader I want to be. Um, and so uh, we can thank Douglas MacArthur for helping uh, Eisenhower, uh, you know, hone, um, hone a different uh, approach to leadership. Now, at an age of 50, uh, your grandfather was a colonel in the military. People didn't say he's going right to the top. He's going to be a four star, five star general. What was it that took him from being a colonel at the age of 50, where some people would say maybe he just should leave the military and maybe he thought about it as well, <laughs> To, to going to the point where he became the Supreme Allied Can Commander. What was the, the, the route that made that possible? Well, there are a couple of things. First of all, that Distinguished Service Medal at the age of 28 didn't, didn't hurt. Um, but he also graduated number one in his class at Command and General Staff School uh, in 1925. So that shows that between West Point um, and, um, and, and this very arduous course that the Army uh, gives that he had straightened up and really gotten serious about uh, life and his career. And, and then from there, which a uh, few people mention it, but uh, he was the chief of staff for the winning side in the Louisiana maneuvers, which is the largest military maneuvers ever uh, orchestrated in the United States of America. They basically took over the whole state of Louisiana. And it was that victory that really brought him to uh, George Marshall's attention. I should have pointed out that at one point uh, later in his president, he got the interstate highway system started, but it is said in some, uh, it may be apocryphal, but that he was given an assignment to drive across the country with some military um, troops to see how it was possible to get across the country. And he then realized, hey, there's no good highway system here. And that maybe led to the interstate highway system. Do you have any views on that? Well, I think that's exactly what happened. It was in 1919. He was part of a truck convoy sent by the army to see how long it would take uh, to cross the country in case of enemy attack. Uh, and it took two months. Uh, they started at the um, ellipse in the middle of summer and didn't get to San Francisco until Labor Day. Um, and during that time they had, I don't know how many automobile breakdowns, uh, everything happened along the way. Then of course, during World War II, uh, there was a big fight for the German Audubon uh, for moving uh, men and materiel, especially during the Battle of the Bulge. So I think that those two factors together made him understand that we, we had to have a system like that in our country. Now it was widely thought that uh, General George Marshall, who was the Army Chief of Staff and a legendary general, was going to be the, the commander of the D-Day invasion when that ever that occurred. Uh, but ultimately President uh, uh, Roosevelt chose your grandfather what was the reason, how did that come about and how did your grandfather get selected when he had honestly not been a com uh, combat soldier uh, for much of his career? Right, well, so I, I think, um, you know, you could put it down to maybe the expression, uh, if, it's don't, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Uh, George Marshall played a very uh, important role in Washington, DC and Dwight Eisenhower had already commanded two of the largest amphibious operations um, you know, ever conducted in military history. Um, uh, that's in North Africa and then in Sicily. Uh, so he already had more experience than anybody else in any kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, deployment uh, onto uh, coastlines. Uh, and then I think um, that uh, I could establish very, very good working relationships with the British. And I think uh, at the end of the day, those were the factors that really led uh, Roosevelt to that decision. Yes, it's true. I mean, uh, Churchill really liked uh, your grandfather. He really admired him and was really happy, I think, with the decision. Though I think General Montgomery would probably was not that happy with it because <laughs> he wanted to have the job, but that's another story. So on D-Day, um, your grandfather is in charge of the largest amphibious invasion in history. Um, was he prepared for the eventuality that it might not succeed? And what did he do to prepare for that eventuality? Well, it's actually a fascinating story because uh, what he does when he's given the command uh, around Christmas time of 1943, 
uh, he gets to work because he didn't like the plan. The plan had been underway for about uh, two years. And when he saw uh, the, the, the plan as it stood then, he didn't think there was nearly enough force that was going to be brought to bear on this operation uh, because it was a combined military operation. It was the largest combined military operation in history too. So, um, you know, it required, they only had uh, three landing beaches uh, against a 50 mile line of uh, German fortifications. And he, he insisted on five, including uh, Utah Beach. So that made actually a pivotal difference on, on D-Day. And uh, uh, it, it turns out, I mean, this is a, a, a perfect example of what a strategic leader does, uh, which is different than operational leaders who might be in combat. Uh, his job was to uh, rationalize the, uh, uh, the strategy, the logistics, uh, um, the firepower, the personnel, the uh, everything into a coherent strategic plan. And, and uh, that came to fruition on D-Day. Now, there's a famous story, I, you can tell us if it's true or not, that he wrote out a uh, letter basically saying, if it had failed, I, I bear responsibility for the failure. He didn't say, well, it wasn't my fault. Somebody else said, then this wrong or somebody else should have done that. And it's really not my fault. Is that right? He took the blame for it. He's prepared to take the blame for it. Well, he did. He had to make a very tough airborne decision. And after he decided to use the airborne troops, to, uh, despite uh, a lot of advice to the contrary, um, they were pivotal for Utah Beach. Uh, he wrote that note, taking full responsibility in case of failure. So think about it. He took responsibility not only for the entire uh, D-Day operation, but he also took um, responsibility for the weather forecast. Um, and uh, rightly so, because it was his decision to go on the day he went after one day of delay. Um, yeah, I, um, I've seen that, I've seen the original of that note, and uh, it's really a very moving testament to his deep belief in the importance of accountability. Now, eventually he goes on to the continent, and one of the things he does is he helps to liberate the concentration camps. What was his view on the concentration camps and what he saw when he went into them and how did he react to it? Well, I have to say, this is one of the things that I, I had to stand back and say, wow, uh, because um, it's hard to imagine uh, what it would be like to be in the kind of state of shock he was when he saw um, the way the Germans had uh, uh, managed this camp called Ordruf. And, and we were soon to find out that there were you know, camps close to every uh, major everything in Germany and in other parts of German occupied territory. Uh, Ike said he'd never been so angry in his life. He was so shocked. He said that he, he found that there weren't any words in the English language that could describe the way he felt. And yet, despite that, at the same time, he's thinking to himself, this is so horrific that if we don't chronicle it right now, people will say 50 years from now that uh, this was just propaganda, this was fake news. Okay, so um, he um, notified uh, General Marshall that evening when he got back to um, camp that uh, he wanted uh, journalists and, and members of Congress to come uh, help him bear witness to this. And he um, uh, ordered everybody who were anywhere near any of these camps to go in and, and photograph it, which is one of the reasons we have um, such a important archive on that subject. So after the war is over, Eisenhower is a great hero, uh, understandably so. And uh, Harry Truman says, look, I don't really think I should run for president in 1948. Uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, why don't you run for president as a Democrat and I'll make sure you get the nomination. Why did he not take that? And was he a Democrat at the time or what was he? Uh, he was a, he was a um, uh, chief of staff of the army. Um, and then he went to, uh, he was the first Supreme um, uh, Commander of, of NATO and he was a military man is what he was. Um, actually, uh, Truman uh, wrote him that letter in 1948 and did so uh, again at the beginning of the next campaign. Um, Ike, Ike thought he was a military man. He had uh, other plans for himself uh, after his retirement. But later when he retired, he became the president of Columbia University. Uh, why did he wanna become president of a university? Well, I think uh, what he really wanted to do was to be involved in the academic community and to have interaction with professors and students. Um, as I say, he was a great student of history himself, and it just appealed to him. 
Uh, and there were uh, Democrats and Republicans, including President Truman, knocking on his door. Nobody knew whether he was a Democrat or Republican because he wouldn't tell anybody. So um, eventually the Republicans come to him and more or less beg him to run. Uh, Tom Dewey, the former governor and the previous nominee in the Republican Party in 48, said, you've got to do it. And um, ultimately, he kind of decided to do it. Uh, what propelled him to do it? And did he really want to run for president? And did he uh, uh, you know, ever regret the decision? Well, I, I don't know whether he regretted the decision because he never talked um, in those terms that, that I heard of. And all the rest of it is speculation. But um, I can say that um, he felt uh, very strongly about a number of things. First of all, the Republicans have been out of power since the Hoover administration. That was, um, there hadn't been a Republican elected president since 1926. And uh, the Republicans were basically blamed for the Great Depression. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a, you know, concerning situation where one other party had been in power so long. I believe that it was really important that we have a vibrant two party system. But more important than that in many ways is the Republican Party, should it come back to power, and it had some prospect of doing so, was an isolationist party uh, and did not um, agree with an internationalist perspective and wanted to come home after World War II. So I uh, took it upon himself to accept their nomination, go on to reshape the party in his eight years to an internationalist party by the end of his presidency. Now, he got the nomination in 1952 fairly handily. Mm -hmm. And then it is said that um, they went to him at the, at the convention and said, who would you like as vice president? And he said, well, I don't really know. Am I supposed to make the decision? I thought the party made it. And mm -hmm. ultimately, it was recommended that somebody named Richard Nixon um, would be the vice presidential nominee. Did he actually ever know Nixon or had he met him before? I don't think so. And I think you're absolutely right. You raise a very important point is that in those days, uh, the party itself had a very, very big say in who was selected as vice president. Uh, but Nixon seemed to, to have it all. He, uh, he was young, so we had the youth factor here. Um, he was uh, anti-communist. This was in a period where Joseph McCarthy, uh, uh, you know, held sway over um, a lot of the public discourse. And, uh, and also he's from California. So there were a lot of electoral college votes in California. And I think it was a combination of those things that sounded appealing. He was right. more conservative than Eisenhower was. So that was good too. So uh, they, they win the, uh, they get the nomination and they win the presidency fairly handily against Adlai Stevenson as the Democratic nominee. As president of the United States, uh, Dwight Eisenhower is said to have instituted some military kinds of things. He had a chief of staff and he had a very formal NSC process and so forth. Um, what was it that you think he contributed to the way the presidency was run that was admirable in terms of the way the, the, the business of being president was actually conducted? That's a great question. Uh, there, there are a couple of things that stood out for me. First of all, um, and I, I feel quite confident that he uh, came to appreciate this during World War II, but he really liked pushback. Uh, he surrounded himself by people of um, differing uh, views uh, on a spectrum between uh, conservative and, and liberal Republican. Uh, he had plenty of moderates in the cabinet too. Uh, but he did bring about a cabinet system. They met once a week. Uh, he chaired the National Security Council. That met once a week. Uh, so he had a, a real structure in place uh, to avoid uh, a situation where he might make a decision based on uh, insufficient uh, information. Uh, and he liked the pushback because everybody brought a different dimension of the issue to his attention. Uh, and this gave him a way to sharpen his own thinking. Uh, he never made a decision, apparently, um, at any of those meetings. He always took himself off into uh, the privacy of his office to make those decisions. But he really liked that, uh, that feedback, that pushback, and that uh, diverse uh, um, uh, inputs. Did Douglas MacArthur ever come by and say, you know, I really am more qualified to be president than you, or he never saw him <laughs> again afterwards? No, no, that's funny because uh, of course, Douglas MacArthur wanted desperately to be president of the United States. And uh, so um, I think he uh, duked it out in the early part of the 1952 uh, convention before his uh, longtime protege got the nomination instead. No, I consulted with, um, uh, General MacArthur uh, over um, what to do about Korea because uh, both generals, um, or I should say both candidates uh, at that time, uh, had uh, grave doubts about the sustainability of the war in Korea. 
Um, but they, they, they kept a much more cordial relationship, I think, than a lot of scholars acknowledge. So during the 1952 campaign, Eisenhower said, I will go to Korea, implying that if he goes there, he can come up with solutions. Did he actually ever go uh, to Korea? And uh, related to that, um, during the, the 52 campaign, he must have said something that upset Harry Truman because they never really talked again afterwards. Yeah, well, uh, they're, two, they're, they're sort of two, but maybe interconnected stories. Uh, yes, I did go to Korea uh, between um, uh, after he was elected and before the inauguration because he, he wanted to understand uh, uh, the situation there. He uh, took a helicopter over the front where um, people were actually in combat. That was a rather risky thing to do and came back and concluded that it was not a winnable war and he did not um, want to uh, continue this as it was. So, um, you know, we had an armistice uh, or he uh, negotiated an armistice, which still survives to this day. That might have been one of the reasons, by the way, that Harry Truman uh, was a little bit um, uh, put off and annoyed uh, by uh, Eisenhower. And then if you think about it, he'd offered Eisenhower the presidency twice as a Democrat. Um, and I went on to bring the Republicans back to uh, presidential power. Well, it is said that when Eisenhower and Truman went, went up Pennsylvania Avenue uh, for the inauguration of Eisenhower, that they didn't talk that entire time. I don't know. Is that true or not? Yeah, there was also another little dust up, which is on a personal side. Uh, my father was uh, deployed in Korea um, uh, in combat, and uh, President Truman brought him back for the inauguration, which was a very gracious, nice thing to do. But these two military men, that is my father and... Um, President Eisenhower looked at each other and they both said, uh, my grandfather says to uh, my father, don't you think you should be back at the front? And my father said, well, I got ordered back here. So you know, that, that was another factor in this whole drama. So um, during the presidency of Eisen President Eisenhower in the first uh, term, he sends military troops in to ensure that in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas, the uh, schools are gonna be desegregated. Was that a controversial decision for him to make? And why was he so determined to enforce the decision that some people say he wasn't really fully supportive of? Well, I think the record doesn't show that. And I, I, I think in my book, I've, I make it pretty clear. Uh, 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 Herbert Brownell, who is his attorney general, wrote uh, a set of memoirs that were extremely instructive about this. But you know, um, I appointed Earl Warren uh, to be chief of staff, or sorry, uh, Supreme Court justice and, uh, uh, um, and uh, Warren uh, was, had very strong views on this subject. They agreed. Uh, I hope uh, this book uh, helps sec set the record straight there, uh, that uh, desegregation was a very important thing. As a matter of fact, even before Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the Eisenhower administration desegregated Washington, DC, over which they had control, um, and wrote an amicus brief for the court on, on Brown. So um, actually desegregating uh, Little Rock, uh, Central High School in Little Rock was a function of implementing Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, he tried to make a deal with Orville Falbus, the uh, governor. The governor went back on his word. And then you don't really do that with Dwight Eisenhower. He sent the 101st Airborne Division to escort these nine African-American students into Central High School. And um, I think uh, he understood that he was um, uh, upholding the law, the Constitution of the United States, and he was in full agreement with it. His uh, diaries and his memoirs uh, indicate that very strongly. Now, uh, by today's standards, Eisenhower is very young when he was elected president. I think he was 62, <laughs> but he did suffer a heart attack during mm -hmm. his first term. Did he consider, because of his health uh, problems, not running for re-election? Did he ever seriously consider just not running again? Well, after that heart attack, uh, he was testing himself constantly to make sure that he still, uh, after his recovery, had the uh, capacities to serve uh, in this job. Uh, he sought uh, medical attention. He got, uh, uh, I mean, medical advice. He got uh, family members together. He got his cabinet together. He, he sought out a lot of people on this subject uh, and finally decided that uh, he would run again, but understanding that uh, he would be prepared to uh, stepped down if he didn't think he was capable of, um, uh, of uh, fulfilling his duties. He felt very strongly about it because, as you know, President Wilson uh, had been incapacitated right. for a very long uh, period of time during a crucial uh, point uh, you know, in the World War I period. 
During his presidency, uh, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, which caused a big furor that we were falling behind the Soviets. But President Eisenhower didn't seem to be publicly that worried about it. Why was he not that worried? And did, what did he know that others didn't know? Well, it's not even that. Um, um, uh, issued on the front page of the New York Times about two days before the launch of Sputnik was an announcement that the Soviet Union would be launching Sputnik. Um, <laughs> they didn't call it Sputnik, but you see, uh, the launching of artificial satellites was an agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union to launch artificial satellites in 1957 as part of International Geophysical Year. So we knew they were going to do it. We were working on um, our own satellite. And as it turns out, it was a good thing that the Soviet Union put up their satellite first because without realizing it, they accidentally established a precedent for freedom of space. So ultimately um, he is reelected and then he is, um, uh, serves two terms. And at the end, he has a choice to support, I guess, his vice president for um, the presidency. Did he fully support Richard Nixon? And there's a famous quote from Dwight <laughs> Eisenhower in which he's asked, well, what did Richard Nixon really do as vice president? And he said, well, if you give me a week, I'll think of something. Was that an unintentional um, put down a president or vice president Nixon? And did he really want Nixon to win that election? Well, uh, that, that was um, uh, an unfortunate um, uh, exchange that occurred as um, Ike was walking off the podium. The press conference was over and somebody shot him that question and he was already halfway out the door. So he turns around and he says, you know, I'll talk to you about it next week or whatever. So uh, it has been misinterpreted, though I will say, and I was surprised in the research for my book, he did consider some other uh, vice presidential um, uh, uh, candidates, um, uh, including a Democrat, by the way, because, you know, Ike wanted... Um, this country to move down a middle way, uh, you know, that, that territory where people from the left and the right could convene in a kind of a, a middle way uh, towards progress. And uh, so I would say in conclusion, uh, David, I think uh, Dwight Eisenhower was certainly the most uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan president of the 20th century, uh, maybe going all the way back to another military leader, um, George Washington, but, you know, um, he, even considered, um, as I say, a Democrat to run with him and a number of other people, but ultimately thought um, that uh, Nixon, you know, had more to learn, but uh, was was already doing a fine job. So Eisenhower is ultimately succeeded by John Kenny. John Kenny's 43 years old. Eisenhower's 70. Eisenhower was a five-star general, and John Kennedy was, let's say, not quite that high up in the military. Did he take John Kennedy seriously as a presidential but candidate? Well, that's a that's a uh, that's a great question. I think um, um, I think Eisenhower worried a little bit about how much experience uh, John Kennedy had. Uh, John Kennedy was a senator too, and we have to uh, remember that uh, uh, the presidency has tended to favor over history uh, governors and others with executive uh, experience. Um, and I think he did worry about that, but uh, he uh, was not. Uh, hesitant to say that he uh, really admired and respected the way John Kennedy came to uh, the White House for um, that um, presidential briefing before the new president took office. Uh, so I would say that it was uh, probably a set of mixed feelings. So Eisenhower and his wife retired to Gettysburg. And he mm -hmm. writes his memoirs, among other things, but he plays more golf. He was criticized for playing golf. I can't imagine a president being criticized for playing golf, but uh, uh, now you can tell us what was his handicap? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not sure. Maybe it was a classified secret. Who knows? <laughs> no, and, I, I think that there are some, um, there are some of those uh, still around, but you know, um, uh, you have to ask anybody who plays at Augusta National Golf Course what kind of a player he was, because there was a very famous tree known as the Eisenhower tree. And that's only because Ike had a, wick, a, a quote unquote wicked slice um, and his balls always ended up hitting that tree and then kind of wrecking up uh, that hole. So um, I would say that um, maybe he was more enthusiastic than he was skilled. But uh, like all of these things, uh, he threw himself into it. Uh, in an enthusiastic way, and it gave him a lot of exercise and time to rest his mind too. So before we uh, have questions from our audience, I have two final quick, quick questions. One, what surprised you about 
uh, your grandfather in doing the research, something you really didn't know? And what would you like, secondly, most people to know uh, in a paragraph about Dwight Eisenhower? Yeah, well, I, I think I was, um, uh, I, I knew it in my heart and my gut, but I was surprised at the detail uh, that I learned. Um, first of all, at one point he thought of starting a third party while he was president, which um, I think is fascinating. Um, he also uh, vetoed an oil and gas bill, even though he supported the bill because he didn't like the way it had been lobbied. And he felt that if uh, the bill passed um, and, and was written into law, that people would lose confidence in the credibility of their government. I mean, all of these, um, I, I was fascinated. I was surprised by the fact uh, that he believed that the Supreme Court should be um, ideologically balanced because it is uh, one of the three co-equal branches of government uh, where the officials are not elected. Uh, so in 1956, going into uh, the campaign, he tells his attorney general to please find me a Democrat because we need that viewpoint to make the, the court ideologically balanced. So uh, overall, uh, he left a pretty much a balanced federal bench uh, before he left office. And I, I was surprised by that. So in terms of what I want people to um, leave with, well, first of all, I think everybody can make up their own mind about him. I do think though that he still has so much to tell us. And in this book, I tried to show how he led, not just what he led uh, or what the issues were. Um, I tried to uh, make him into a human being because so often uh, the scholarship on these things are more focused around the issues and the decisions than they are uh, what kind of leadership impulses um, are native to the person in question. In this case, I uh, want uh, everyone to take away that he was, um, he was a, a, a very sharp, very sharp uh, studied mind. Um, and he could be as tough as he had to be, but at the end of the day, he led with heart, he led with empathy, um, and he uh, made sure that trust, which is the bedrock of leadership, was something um, that people felt about him. And I think um, uh, it was so important that he, um, you know, was a servant leader and uh, always put his country first from that moment that he um, raised his hand and dedicated his life to uh, defending the Constitution of the United States as a, as a young plebe at West Point. Uh, okay. And I think that's what I'd like to leave people with. Thank you. Okay, Louise, you have some questions from uh, our audience? Um, I, first of all, let me say thank you very, very much to both of you. I think we all learned a lot. I certainly uh, knew nothing about uh, Dwight Eisenhower's leadership uh, in uh, the great influenza epidemic. So um, that's, that's really terrifically interesting these times. Okay, let me go to uh, the first question from our audience, which is, there's an iconic photo of then General Eisenhower inspecting cultural treasures recovered from the Nazis a month before the end of World War II. At the time, did he recognize the importance of protecting important landmarks and artwork? Did he ever speak uh, to the monument men? or stay in touch with them after the war? Well, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Uh, yes, it was on his orders that the Monuments Men uh, were formed. Uh, obviously, um, um, President Roosevelt uh, supported and advanced this idea, but it was Eisenhower who turned it into an actionable item. Uh, he issues a number of orders, including uh, just prior to D-Day, um, the instructions about how to pr uh, protect um, uh, historic um, uh, landmarks uh, and the rest of it. And um, yes, that, uh, that famous picture uh, where, you know, he's looking at all this uh, loot, including um, what was thought to be uh, the Nazis uh, remaining uh, monetary reserves. Um, and, you know, he felt very strongly about trying to uh, get these possessions back to the people who had had them uh, stolen or uh, taken from them. Um, and um, he later received um, a, a wonderful award at uh, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art after the war for his contributions to uh, protecting um, the artistic treasures of Europe. Thank you, great. Um, 
Next question. In your book, uh, Susan, you describe President Eisenhower as a strategic leader rather than an operational leader. What are the core differences in these leadership styles? Well, obviously, if you're an operational uh, leader for long enough, you learn some extremely important skills. Eisenhower was regarded as one of the great logisticians uh, from his uh, work between the wars. And uh, also, um, he had a lot of contact uh, uh, with uh, men who were off to fight because he had uh, uh, commanded that training unit. All of this information, including, by the way, the American battlefields of France, he knew um, every road and every um, intersection in uh, rural France because of that work he did for General Pershing. So what you do when you're finally a strategic leader is you bring all of that experience together. You don't have one piece of the operation, you have the whole operation under your uh, command and responsibility. Uh, and that, that's a very big difference because if you only have one part of the operation, like the airborne section, for instance, um, you know, um, a certain number of things would be logical in that context to the Supreme Commander. He has to integrate the airborne um, uh, mission with all of the other factors, including, by the way, politics, allied politics, disagreements in the high command, uh, resource allocation, um, uh, all the other things I mentioned earlier. So it's the, the person who has to uh, rationalize a million moving parts. Okay, thank you. Um, this one's a question for David. Having worked with President Jimmy Carter as Deputy Assistant to the President for Domestic Policy, did President Carter ever indicate how President Eisenhower may have influenced his own approach to leadership? <laughs> Well, Jimmy Carter was a person who was a military man. He had spent uh, more than a decade in the military, so he obviously admired uh, military leaders like um, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower had passed away uh, before President Carter was really elected to anything. He had been elected, really, or elected anything to consequence. He was elected governor of Georgia in 1970, and Dwight Eisenhower had passed away a, a little bit before that. But mm -hmm. I think he, he admired um, many of the things that Dwight Eisenhower did, and I think he admired the kind of leadership um, that uh, Dwight Eisenhower gave. And while Jimmy Carter was not maybe as um, successful a president as Dwight Eisenhower is seen to be, um, he did try to use a lot of military organizational techniques in the, in the White House. Um, they didn't maybe work as well in the way he did it, but I do think he admired Dwight Eisenhower and certainly uh, uh, looked up to him for what he had did, uh, what he had done for our country, and he spoke very eloquently about him when he gone to Europe and he visited uh, Normandy as well. Mm. Thank you. Um, so here's a question: How would uh, President Eisenhower feel about our 21st century presidents and uh, how they approached international conflict and diplomacy as well as domestic policy? Well, first of all, uh, as I said earlier, his objective uh, during the war uh, was to bring about uh, unity of purpose uh, among uh, the first ever fully um, integrated international um, uh, uh, group uh, uh, command. I mean, that's, that's what it was. We uh, had our allies fully integrated um, with our own uh, generals and other commanders. Um, so that unity of purpose he brings to the White House, and I think if he were um, looking at today's environment, uh, he would be deeply concerned about the divisions that we have in this country. Uh, not only um, is it bad for our country and bad for our democracy, but he did point out during the worst of the McCarthy years um, that these deep divisions are, um, a quote, a welcome sight to an alert enemy. And here's a question, what historical figures did he revere and why? Well, he, um, he loved, um, actually, it's interesting, coming from a pacifist household, I said he may have had a little streak of rebellion. He loved military history. Um, and he read uh, all about the Punic Wars. He could, uh, you know, he used to talk to my siblings and, and um, me about uh, all the campaigns he knew about, all the Russian, em or sorry, all the uh, Roman empires. He, he um, once at Columbia University was uh, asked about the soft underbelly of Europe and, and uh, Dwight Eisenhower gave them a lecture on Philip of Macedonia. Um, so he was uh, deeply, uh, well, he was self-taught largely in this. 
Um, but this is, I'm sure, a reason too why he loved the artifacts and the art uh, that went with those periods and was so uh, keen to preserve them to the extent that we could um, in, in, during the war. Um, so uh, uh, someone in our audience wants to know, David, whether you've collected around Eisenhower. And whether <laughs> I have what? Collected around Eisenhower. Whether you have any Eisenhower materials in your collection. Um, I have some, uh, some things, but one of the things I'm interested in is we were talking about it with earlier with Susan. Um, a number of our presidents have been and distinguished leaders have been painters. So there are <laughs> paintings you can buy that from John Kennedy. Uh, there are some uh, from <laughs> Winston Churchill and Dwight Eisenhower was a painter. And I was asking Susan earlier um, if she has any uh, paintings by uh, her grandfather and I I've thought about buying some paintings uh, from, I have some from other presidents, but I haven't bought one yet from Eisenhower, but Hope Springs Eternal. Ah, well, yes, well, he was, he was, um, uh, he enjoyed doing that. He didn't uh, uh, take it as seriously as uh, some former presidents or most especially uh, the British prime minister, but uh, uh, he did it, you know, to center himself. It was like a mindfulness exercise, and uh, he would often just completely out of the blue uh, talk about uh, uh, the way certain colors looked. Uh, he was very conscious of, of that and, and uh, loved it as a hobby. I think it did, did him a lot of good, and it helped him uh, settle his mind. So, David, I'll be on the lookout for you there in case. Okay. But, but we're not going to we're going to make sure that uh, if we find anything for you, it's not going to be uh, uh, one of his... Um, uh, lesser works, shall we okay. say. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Well, I think that that does it for us uh, this evening. I, I really want to thank both of you. It's been um, uh, terrifically informative and, uh, you know, really um, stimulating conversation. We've, uh, as I said before, we've learned a lot, but I think we've also been inspired by um, by what you've, you've talked about, both on the personal level, Susan, and uh, in terms of President Eisenhower's leadership. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, David, as always, for um, moderating thank a great you. session. And thanks very much to our audience for joining us this evening. We, we do, as I said, appreciate all of you and your great support for our institution. Thank you and good evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot.